So from a very young age, I've always had quite an inquisitive nature about myself. And as a young kid, I would always be snooping around my big sister's bedroom and trying to put the pieces of the puzzle of her life together and figure out what she was up to. And I suppose I like to call it being inquisitive. However, I think my family and my sister would call it just being nosy. So using this natural curiosity and natural nosiness, I explored the world of science. And then as I got older and was trying to decide what to do with my life and what sort of career I wanted to pursue, I was introduced to the world of forensic science. And in the world of forensic science, I can apply my knowledge and uh, passion and drive for DNA and for genetics and also combine it with this nosiness and natural curiosity that I had to put the pieces of a puzzle of a crime back together. And ultimately for the purposes of using science to serve justice. So I've been a forensic DNA expert now for many, many years. And I have been able to harness this passion that I have for DNA and for genetics and apply it to not just criminal investigations and cold case investigations, but I'm also able to apply it into the classroom. And I'm able to inspire and hopefully train the next generation of forensic scientists. And I really don't think I'm ever going to get bored of my chosen career because it really is such an exciting field because we continually have these new advances being made, these new discoveries being made, both in the world of forensic science, but also in the broader genetics and DNA world as well. And we're able to combine those and apply them to criminal investigations. So we continually have these new techniques, new tools and new methods that can bring us to greater depths and allow us to do things that we never thought would ever be even possible. In forensic investigations, uh, one of the most recent new tools that we have been utilizing in, in just the last few years has been that of utilizing all of this consumer genetic data that exists out in the world and applying that to criminal investigations by harnessing the power of that consumer genetic data and combining it with building family trees and using genealogy. And with these tools, we're able to now crack open cold cases, some of which are decades old. Now, what do I mean by this consumer genetic data that exists? Well, I'm sure you're all familiar with these at-home DNA tests that we have, where these companies are encouraging you to explore this more complete story of you or they're encouraging you to amaze yourself and to go on this DNA journey. Now, within these companies, and I'm sure some people have actually taken one of these here, you can learn this fascinating information about how, and learn it from your DNA, about how your ancestors traveled and journeyed throughout time and throughout history over hundreds of years. And even with that, you can learn that your own DNA might have origins from many different countries all over the world, and your own biogeographic ancestry can actually be presented in this beautiful, colorful map. Now, when I first took my first consumer DNA test, I was particularly excited to learn about my own DNA origins because I'm actually adopted, and so I really didn't have any clue as to what my DNA origins might be. And so when I took my first consumer DNA test, and then I got the results back, my map was nowhere near as colorful as anyone else's map whatsoever. I am a whopping 100% Irish, or 100% potato, as I like to say. But although I was a little bit disappointed, uh, I still nevertheless was able to make these fascinating discoveries because not only in these uh, consumer DNA databases do they show you your biogeographic ancestry, but they also connect you with other consumers within that database and with whom you share some segments of DNA with and therefore you're genetically related to them. 
And it can be quite shocking to see this list of tens of thousands of people who are your DNA relatives, many of whom you've never met, you've never even heard of, and you probably didn't even know that they existed. And for me, this was very exciting because I'd never known anyone to share my DNA. So how many people are in these consumer DNA databases? Well, if we look at just the top four of the most popular consumer DNA databases or companies with Ancestry DNA, they have over 21 million people in their database. In 23andMe, they have over 13 million people. In MyHeritageDNA, they have over 6 million people. And in um, Family Tree DNA, they have over 2 million people. Now, if we add up all of those numbers, that is a whopping 42 million people worldwide who have not only volunteered their DNA data to these companies, they've also paid for it to be sequenced. And think of just that volume and masses of genetic data that is now out there and available to the world. So with this genetic data, and how they're making these DNA, identifying these DNA relatives within the databases, how exactly are they going about that and matching people up as DNA relatives? Well, it begins with just the simple rules of inheritance. We all know that we get 50% of our DNA from our biological mother and 50% of our DNA from our biological father. And so the same was true for them where they got their DNA from their parents, and so you share about 25% of your DNA with your biological grandparents. And so as we go back each generation in time, you'll see that this number actually halves with each generation that we go back. Now that's pretty easy to understand when we look at it that way, that it's uh, halved in the amount of DNA that you're sharing as you go backwards. But don't forget, your DNA, uh, your genetic family tree doesn't just go backwards in time, it also goes forwards in time, and it also goes outwards in time. So think about also your aunts and your uncles, and all of their children, so their descendants, therefore our uh, uh, cousins, and because we all share common ancestors with them, we also share DNA with them. Don't forget about your grand aunts and uncles, your great grand aunts and uncles, and even your great great grand aunts and uncles. This is just all that I could fit on the slide here. And so, truly, your genetic family tree can truly encompass tens of thousands of people, many of whom you've never met, you probably didn't even know existed, and you probably don't even recognize their last names. So, this field of genetic genealogy has emerged in the last 20 years where we can combine the use of consumer DNA data with building family trees through the more traditional form of genealogy and using records and documents to build out family trees and identify people. And this has become not just a popular tool for uh, hobbyist genealogists and professional genealogists, but also for people seeking to answer questions about their biological identities. So take, for example, an adoptee who is seeking to identify their biological parents. They can now use consumer DNA databases to find DNA matches and hopefully find one on both the maternal and the paternal side of their family tree. And then using those DNA matches, build those trees of those individuals backwards in time and then hopefully build them forwards in time after they've identified the common ancestor in order to solve the biological identities of their parents. Now, I did this myself for me to, uh, to resolve my own biological paternity question, and so have hundreds of thousands of people worldwide, if not well over a million at this point. And so when I think of these questions of solving identities with DNA and using con uh, consumer DNA, we also have to kind of open ourselves up to all the news headlines that we see all over the world as, uh, all the time. We see these stories of these family secrets being exposed. We see these stories of people finding long lost relatives 
uh, and siblings that never knew each other existed. But ultimately, they are just um, answering these questions uh, and, and resolving the identities of unknown people. And think about it in forensic investigations. Isn't that what we do also? When we have DNA evidence at a crime scene and we're trying to identify who that DNA belongs to, well, then it makes you think, well, why aren't we harnessing all of this consumer DNA data to do that? And we've been using DNA in forensic science for many, many years, for well over 30 plus years. The first case that ever used DNA evidence was in 1986, when forensic DNA profiling was used to not only convict a murderer, but also in the exact same case to exonerate an innocent person. And that was all with thanks to the wonderful discoveries by Sir Alec Jeffries, who identified or discovered the, the, the method of forensic DNA profiling, or also known as forensic DNA fingerprinting. And what he realized or discovered was that we all have, in particular locations of our DNA, these repeat sequences. And although we all have the same repeat sequence at these locations, the number of times that they are repeated is what is different between each individual. And so in this way, we can differentiate person one from person two using their forensic DNA profile. And so with this method of forensic DNA profiling, of course, it has revolutionized what we've been able to do for 30 plus years. But in a way, sometimes we hit these brick walls. In a typical forensic investigation with DNA evidence, let's say we have a biological sample left behind at a crime scene, and that's been left behind by the perpetrator of a crime, and we want to identify whose DNA this is. In this circumstance, we'll take that forensic DNA profile and we will compare it against a uh, reference DNA profile from a um, uh, suspect perhaps in an investigation, or we might upload it to a criminal DNA database. And here in the US, that's called CODIS. And if we get a hit um, in the database, or if we get a match to our suspect, great, we might have just solved our case. However, more often than not, we don't get a match or we don't get a hit in the database, and our case can actually go cold. We can hit a brick wall. And so we're waiting for this, we're waiting for either new evidence to come to light, or we're waiting for new suspects to be brought into the investigation, or perhaps we're waiting for um, the perpetrator to be convicted for another crime and for them to be entered into the database that way. And so if we think about what this means in terms of the amount of crimes that we can actually solve, and if we look at the numbers that we have today with uh, our unsolved cases in the United States, in the United States alone, we have over a quarter of a million unsolved homicides. That's a staggering number. We also have over 20,000 unidentified human remains cases. Unidentified human remains cases are typically known to the public as Jane and John Doe's. These are individuals that have been found deceased, yet we don't know who they are. And there's a family out there somewhere wondering what happened to them and where they are, uh, and certainly don't they deserve to have their identities restored. So with all of this staggering numbers of cases, we needed something new. We needed a new tool of some sort to be able to address and crack open all of these cold cases. So jump to 2018, just four years ago, and some very, very clever investigators, they must have been seeing these headlines that we all were seeing of people resolving these unidentified, uh, uh, of resolving these um, uh, identities of unknown people and biological parentage using consumer DNA data. And they said, surely we could use that too in forensic investigations. And so the case that truly brought it to the forefront of the attention of the forensic science communities and also of the law enforcement communities was that of the case of the Golden State Killer, when it was announced that he had finally been identified after evading capture for over 43 years. The Golden State Killer was responsible for the murders of over a dozen people, over 50 rapes, 
and over 100 home burglaries. And when they said that they had used this new DNA technique, this new DNA tool, I was immediately curious, what new tool are you talking about? How do I get my hands on it? Then whenever it was announced that it had been using consumer DNA data and had been using genealogy and family tree building, well, then my worlds really collided because my professional career as a forensic DNA expert was now colliding with my personal passion and my personal interest in biogeographic ancestry and building trees and revealing biological identities. So today, that's what we're able to do. We're able to apply this technique to uh, forensic investigations. And we've dubbed it over the last few years forensic genetic genealogy, or also some people call it investigative genetic genealogy. Now, it's important to note here that when this was announced in 2018 that law enforcement and forensic scientists were using uh, consumer DNA databases, there was a lot of criticism that, well, what about privacy? What about consent? So today, there's just two genetic genealogy databases that we're allowed to use, and that is GEDmatch and Family Tree DNA. And both of those companies said, let's put the issue of consent into the hands of the users within those databases. So everyone in those databases can either opt in or they can opt out for their DNA to be compared to a law enforcement or forensic upload from a perpetrator of a violent crime. And so in the, just the last four short years, since April 2018, this has had an incredible impact in resolving cold case investigations. Just here in the United States, there have been over 500 cases solved using forensic genetic genealogy. 500 cases in just four years, many of which perhaps would have never been solved without this new tool. And just think of all the cases that we're working on today and all the cases that we can apply this, this tool to in the future. Perhaps someday we won't have any more cold cases. Doubt it, but a girl can dream. So perhaps now some of you here are thinking, well, maybe there's a killer hiding in my family tree somewhere. And if you are, there very may well be, if you are, I would urge you to consider uploading to one of the two databases, GEDmatch and Family Tree, because your DNA could be what helps solve an investigation or, or identifies a killer. And if you think about it, as these databases grow and more people contribute to these databases, we therefore have more pieces of the puzzle. And my favorite part of this really is that at the end of the day, in reality, we do not need the perpetrator or the Jane or John Doe to have ever taken a home DNA test or a consumer DNA test. We only need one of their tens of thousands of distant cousins that they've never met, they didn't even know exist, to have taken a test and uploaded to the database. Because using that cousin, we can build those family trees backwards in time and we can then build them forward to lead us to and to reveal the, ident the, the, the true born identity of our unknown persons. Thank you.